Team Fortress 2, one of the best online multiplayer games of all time, and a game that is absolutely loved. However, most people don't know about how it was made. So today, I'm going to cover the development history of Team Fortress 2. Team Fortress started as a free mod for Quake, released in 1996. It was developed by an Australian development team called TF Software. Some people on the original team included John Cook, Robin Walker, Ian Coley, and Anthony Studer. The TF Software team ended up being acquired by Valve Software in 1998. Along with the acquisition, was an announcement stating that Team Fortress 2 would be developed and released later on in the year, as a free expansion pack for Half-Life. Valve did work on Team Fortress 2 by working on a project called Valve's Team Fortress, which had a realistic military look, however the project was stalled due to the TF team wanting to switch focus to another project that they had been working on, this other project being Team Fortress Classic. Released in April of 1999, it was a port of the original Team Fortress mod, but this time made with Valve's Gold Source engine. It was primarily made to promote Half-Life's software development kit. The Team Fortress team continued working on Valve's Team Fortress, only for it to be cancelled. However, the work that was done on Valve's Team Fortress was redone and used on the next iteration of Team Fortress 2. It was shown one month after the release of Team Fortress Classic at E3 1999, this time called Team Fortress 2 Brotherhood of Arms. Brotherhood of Arms maintained the military look of Valve's Team Fortress on top of being a first-person strategy shooter. It also brought some pretty impressive technological and gameplay changes to Team Fortress. First off, the technological side. It was supposed to have Intel's multi-resolution mesh technology, or MRM technology. MRM technology changes the amount of polygons used on a model based on the distance. The closer a model is, the more polygons it will have, while if a model is further, it will have less polygons. That wasn't the only thing related to models Brotherhood of Arms had. It also was supposed to have parametric animation. Parametric animation allows multiple animations to blend together rather than having the game choose just one animation while doing multiple things, allowing more situations to look more realistic. Another realistic technical aspect was the map design. It was intended to have the maps look as realistic as they could be, at least as realistic as early 2000s technology could get. As for the gameplay side, Brotherhood of Arms was to have grenades. Although this wasn't new to Team Fortress, it was going to have more variation on the types of grenade, like gas, smoke, and fire grenades that were meant to be realistic. Brotherhood of Arms was also supposed to have military vehicles that players could use and an in-game voice chat that had the player's model move its mouth whenever the player spoke, and according to Robin Walker, the voice chat was going to be on a proximity basis. Additionally, Brotherhood of Arms was going to have a new HUD, which would have a live summary of what was happening, with a compass pointing to the objective, optional map, waypoints, however, this HUD was never shown during screenshots and footage that were made public, since normally they used Team Fortress Classics HUD or another variation of TFC's HUD just with appearance changes. Lastly, the classes. We had 12 classes in this iteration of the game. Nine classes similar to the original nine, which go as follows. The Marine, who was a more realistic version of the soldier with an AR and rocket launcher. The Machine Gunner, which was essentially a more realistic heavy with an LMG that could be mounted on sandbags for more efficient use. The Sniper, same as the Team Fortress Classic Sniper, but could blend into the environment if he stood still and didn't move 
for a certain amount of time. The Commando. He was similar to the Demo Man since he had a grenade launcher and basically did the same things. The Flamethrower. Pretty much the Pyro, but with a nicer looking flamethrower. The Ranger, who was just similar to the Scout. The Field Medic, who wasn't like the Team Fortress Classic Medic. This Medic could heal and revive teammates with his weapons being self-defense focused, but only if needed. The Engineer. He was similar to his Team Fortress Classic counterpart and could move his sentries. The Spy. The spy in this version of the game was pretty similar to the Team Fortress Classic spy, but with an instant kill attack that was done with a wire to choke the enemy to death, and could only disguise as an enemy that he had killed. And the three new classes were the Officer, who could increase players' morale and lead a charge. He also had infrared goggles and smoke grenades. The Instructor who was not a proper class but rather a instruction bot to teach players the game. And lastly, the commander, who was going to be the most important class in the game. He could see the whole map through team members' eyes, engineer built cameras, and see the whole map, and was able to issue orders on the fly and control squads and groups. All this, however, was all would ever know about this version of Team Fortress 2, since by mid-2000, another delay was announced for TF2 due to Valve wanting to swap the game to the newer in-house engine that was eventually called Source. And by 2002, Valve had decided to change Brotherhood of Arms from a realistic shooter to more of a sci-fi theme. This version of the game wasn't announced officially, since all knowledge of this iteration of the game was found due to the whole of Valve's servers being leaked in 2003 with additional artwork and information having come out since then. The leak provided the source code of TF2 Invasion, two player models, and concept art. And eventually, with this available, a team of modders made a playable build of TF2 Invasion. However, to make the build, the team had to use custom assets along with the two models and source code for the build to work. Additionally, development was very reliant on the source code since it contained most of the information from this iteration of the game. Invasion had two teams, the humans and the aliens, both competing for resources which can be picked up by players after killing a player and are supposed to be added to a bank of resources for the team. The resources can be used to make buildings and the teams have two major differences. Humans can buy objects for cheap However, they require power, while aliens don't require the power, but have more expensive objects. Additionally, there was one new class, and nine classes similar to the original nine of Team Fortress. These classes had some changes that made them different to previous versions of Team Fortress. These classes are... The Commando, the only class that seemed to have been finished. It had a plasma rifle, a couple of plasma grenades, and a shield. It also had an adrenaline rush ability which gave it more health, speed, and damage for a small period of time. It could also do adrenaline rampage, which worked similarly to the charge and targe, and had a battle cry that provided a less effective adrenaline rush for team members that could hear it. Next up, the Defender. Pretty much an engineer but with a laser rifle and combat shield. It could also build sentries which had plasma guns and could improve sensors and rockets. It could also unlock more weapons with technology. Weapons that could close doors in a map, get a max of three sentries, and also repair buildings. The Infiltrator, a class similar to the Spy. It could eavesdrop on the enemy voice chat and team chat when close to the enemy. It could also use thermal vision, use bullet firing and limpet firing weapons, and could even consume corpses if the technology for it was gained. The Medic, a combat medic with a repair gun and plasma rifle. It could heal players and buildings with technology, upgrade buildings, and regenerate 10 HP per second. Pyro, same concept as the regular Team Fortress Pyro, but with only one quote-unquote change. Pyro had a gas can that could be used to trap enemies in fire. The Recon, 
basically scout with dual semi-automatic pistols, and the recon was 25% faster than other classes. It could throw sticky grenades that could attach onto enemies, he could double jump, and the jump would give a boost towards the direction the player was looking at. He could also jump on walls with an ability. The support. The support was supposed to use mortars to suppress enemies and use only explosives, being equipped with a grenade launcher and rocket launcher. Mortars also had variations that could be unlocked with technology. The Escort. A class like the Heavy, but with more focus on defense. It also had a power shield that could lose power when absorbing damage. The Escort had a minigun and an exclusive harpoon, and could also punch enemy players with a switch to alt fire. The Sabber had a shotgun and was built to sabotage technology, had a drain beam that would drain health from enemies and their buildings, and the drain health could be used to give speed and health to teammates and itself. And lastly, the Sniper. Although it didn't have any code for its weapons, it was assumed it would have a sniper rifle and might have technology similar to Brotherhood of Arms, like the cloaking technology that was mentioned earlier. Another thing that Invasion shares similarities to Brotherhood of Arms was the inclusion of vehicles. This version was supposed to have six of them. A wagon which was meant to be the most basic vehicle and could only transport players, a battering ram meant to destroy defensive structures such as barbed wire, a tank that was offensive, strong, and more durable than the previously mentioned battering ram, teleporters that worked just like the Team Fortress classic teleporters, striders which had the Half-Life 2 strider model, and the mini strider which had concept art and would be a smaller and cheaper version of the strider. Now I know that was a lot of information, and probably pretty complex information as well. I don't blame you if you thought that, because it seems that Valve themselves thought this as well. In a developer commentary, Robin Walker talks about TF2 being overly complex during development. In addition, our game had become overly complex due to our attempts to add a strategy layer deep enough to warrant the addition of the commander in the first place. In the end, we made the hard decision to remove him from the game and moved on. So this iteration was probably cancelled due to being complex and also being leaked. And with the cancellation of TF2 Invasion, we get to the final iteration of the game. It was unveiled at E3 in July of 2006, showing TF2 with the 20th century commercial illustration art style and the nine mercenaries we all know and love. Not much is known about the development for the final iteration, however the art style that was shown was mostly kept with only some minor changes to certain models, and by September of 2007, a beta release of TF2 was out for anyone who had pre-ordered the orange box, had bought an ATI HD 2900 XT graphics card, or was part of Valve's Cyber Cafe program. Lastly, on October 7th, 2007, the orange box was released, and with it, one of the best games of all time, Team Fortress. Two. Well, that's the end of this video. I just want to say three things. One, the sources I use for this video are available as a link to a Google Doc in the description below. Two, if you wish to contact me or just chat and relax, I have a Discord and a Twitter in the link of the description. Three, a massive thank you to all of you who subscribed. It means a lot to me, and I hope this video and all future videos of mine meet the expectation you have for me. And that's it. So, I'ma head out.